A lot of people right now are really excited about putting up holiday LEDs, and that's fantastic. I've learned a lot of stuff since I made that first video about my holiday lights. So in this video, I'm going to go through a list of the lessons I've learned. Are you ready? Good. Number one is over the air updates. Big thanks to Nicholas Craig. I knew about over the air updates and I had it on my list of things to try someday, but Nick was nice enough to take my LED sketch and add all the parts I needed to do over the air updates and then explain to me how to do it. Thanks, Nick. There's a new file on the GitHub page for this video. It's called Outside LEDs Public OTA 2. Let's walk through the parts of the sketch that make it possible to update sketches over the air. The other Arduino sketch I have opened here is the basic OTA example from the Arduino IDE. If you wanted to use over the air updates for a different sketch, all the parts that you need are in this basic OTA file. You can just copy them and paste them into your own sketch and it'll work on any Arduino sketch, as far as I know. The first new things that you'll see on this OTA sketch are three new libraries. Arduino OTA, ESP8266M DNS, and Wi-Fi UDP. In the new sketch, you still need to put your Wi-Fi name and password here. This next part lets you name the ESP board that you're using. Where it says sensor name, put some unique name that will let you know which board this is. This will be important when we go to connect to this board and update the sketch over the air in a few minutes. You can also put a password on the board. You'll need to have that password if you want to update your sketch over the air. Can't imagine that there's going to be a lot of people that'll want to hack into your network and then upload a new malicious Arduino sketch onto your lights board. But if you have the chance to put a password in, probably a good idea. Here you put your MQTT broker IP address, username, and password, just like before. For the next part, scroll down to the setup function. There's a whole section here called OTA setup. It doesn't require any changes. It's in the sketch on the GitHub page. You can just copy and paste it from there. The last thing that you need to add to your sketch will be in the loop function. And it's this little line right here that says Arduino OTA handle, and that's it. Now save your sketch and upload it to your board using the USB connector or just like you did before. But once this sketch is on your board, the next time you want to do an update, you can do it over the air. Now restart your Arduino IDE, open the tools menu, and under ports, you should see a new network port. And it'll have the name of whatever you called your board under sensor name. It'll also have the IP address of the board. So now I'm going to upload a new sketch over the air. For this example, I'm just going to use the basic OTA sketch. Once I've selected the network board in the tools menu, I just hit upload. The first thing that it'll do is ask you to put the password in. Once you put the password in, it should say authenticating OK and then uploading. If it doesn't, go back through the sketch and compare yours with the basic OTA example. Most likely you're missing something. That's it. Number two is an easy one, but it stumped me and it stumped a lot of other people. I love that the developers of Home Assistant are putting out new updates every couple of weeks. That's fantastic. But in the 0.55 update, they replaced input slider with input number. So if you're running a version of Home Assistant that is 0.55 or newer, and you're trying to run a sketch that says input slider, like my old LED sketch did, it won't work. But don't worry, super simple to fix. All you have to do is to go into your configuration.yaml file, search for anywhere it says input slider, and then just replace it with input number. That's all you have to do. All right, point number three, flickering. I had some trouble with flickering, and I know some other people have too. This is what my flickering looked like. Flickering like this is a sign of a problem with the data signal. Here's a few things to try first that are pretty easy to fix. Make sure that your data wire is as short as it can be. Make sure that the connections between the data wire and the LEDs is really secure. Solder it if you can. You could also try using shielded wire for your data connection. And finally, there are some changes that you can make to your Arduino sketch that can get rid of your flickering. Here's how you do it. I asked the nice folks in the Fast LED Google Plus group for some help with my flickering. And a couple guys named Will Cook and Brian Lewis helped me out. These are the solutions I got from them. Thanks, guys. First, at the beginning of your sketch, where you're including your libraries, right above the Include Fast LED Library, put this line here. Now scroll down to your setup function and add this line. I did not put these in the Arduino sketch on the GitHub page. 
because not everybody's going to need them. But they are in the description, so if you need them, you can cut and paste them from there. If that first method didn't work, here's another one to try. Buried deep in your Arduino libraries folder is a file called Clockless ESP8266. Find it and open it with Notepad++ or some other text editor. Find the line that starts with template and ends with wait time. The default wait time is 5. Change that to 18, then save it, and you're done. Now go back to your Arduino IDE, open your sketch, go to Tools, and select a different board. It doesn't matter what board you select. The idea here is to cause an error by picking the wrong board. Pick the wrong board and then compile the sketch. You'll get an error. That's what's supposed to happen. Once that error pops up, go back to the Tools menu and select the correct board. This time, when you verify the sketch, you'll see a message at the bottom that says, Rebuilding All. Now the new clockless file that you edited will be uploaded. Now you don't need to do both of these solutions. You should be able to get rid of your flickering with one or the other. Number four, jumping a gap. You may come to a point where you want a gap between lights. Maybe you want to jump from one section of your roof to another, and you just want to run wires, not lights. As far as I knew, that was impossible. But then a guy named Single Tracks and Whiskey proved to me that it was possible. He used a 16 gauge shielded cable and jumped a 12 foot gap with his lights. I don't have any of that kind of wire, so I haven't tested this myself. But if a guy named Single Tracks and Whiskey says it works, it works. Number five, overloading. So even though you may be only working with five volt lights, it's still possible to have a lot of current running through your wires. So it's important that you pay attention to how much current your lights are drawing. You can try and do some calculations and figure out how much current your lights are gonna draw and decide how big a wire you're gonna need and what size power supply you're gonna need, but you may be wrong. The bottom line is, if any part of your system starts feeling hot, I don't mean a little warm, I mean hot, then you need to change something. Either you need less lights or bigger wire or bigger power supply. It might not be quite as important as gravity, but Ohm's law is still more than a suggestion. Like it or not, we gotta live by it. Point number six, voltage conversion. In the last video, I talked about using a computer power supply so that you could have 12 volt lights and a five volt or even a three volt control board. But there's another solution that you should know about. We got this here fancy thing called a buck converter. Sounds very American, buck. I don't know why it's called a buck converter, but that's what it's called. Anyways, with a buck converter, you can put higher voltage in one side, turn a dial and get lower voltage out the other side. So if you have a 12 volt power supply or even a 24 volt power supply, you can connect that to the input side and then dial it down so that you've got five volts coming out on the output side. There are a wide variety of these. These happen to be the ones that I've used and they work well. You do need a voltmeter to make sure you get your voltage correct. I had some people ask how to do a few automations with their lights. So I'll walk you through a couple that I have. First, I'll show you how to do it the old fashioned way in your automations old section in your configuration file. Give your automation a name, then set the initial state and hide entity status. Now for the trigger, the platform is sun and the event is sunset. I'm using the condition to set these effects to turn on only in November and December. Now for the action, we'll call the service MQTT publish. The topic is our set effect topic. Your topic name may be different. Make sure you put yours here. And the payload is the name of the effect that we want displayed first, followed by a delay of one hour, meaning it'll stay on that effect for one hour. The rest of this is just a repeat of the first action only with different effect names. So every hour for three hours, it changes effects. The other way to make automations is through the automation editor. Click the plus in the lower right corner to start a new automation. Give your automation a name. And then for the trigger, I've used the time 10 PM. For the condition, I want it to check the state of the lights to see if they're on. Then for the action, we call the service light turn off and the entity ID is the name of the lights. The last point I wanna make is that there are some controllers that are pretty, but not so smart. There are some folks who aren't quite ready to set up Home Assistant, start writing Arduino sketches, and get maximum control of their LEDs, but they still wanna have good looking LEDs. So with those folks in mind, I tried to find a controller that I thought worked pretty well that you could control a lot of lights with. 
I settled on this one. I'm sure there are plenty others that would work perfectly well, but I picked this one for a few reasons. One, it comes in 12 volts or 5 volts. It also connects to the 2812 or 2811 lights. It's got plenty of animations and it's easy to scroll through them. It's got a standard power connector and they claim it can run over 2000 lights. I can tell you for sure that it'll run at least 500 because that's what I use to test it. And most important, it's purdy. That's for you, Mary. All right, that's it. Hope that was helpful. I'm still learning. There's so much to know about these lights and all the cool stuff you can do with them. If you do a cool project with your lights, make a little video, share a link in the comments. I'm sure everybody else would love to see it. Thanks for watching. Thanks for all the questions and ideas. Next week, I'm gonna do another video about Sonoffs. Until then, adios.